Welcome along to 20 Minute Topic. I'm Marcus Stead and I'm joined as usual by Greg Lance Watkins. Today, Boris Johnson is in the spotlight. What are we to make of his handling of the pandemic? And if he's not the right person to lead the country, then who on earth is? Do stay with us. Well, Greg, it's quite hard, I think, to assess Boris Johnson's popularity at the moment, because when we think back to the start of lockdown in March of last year, there was a huge amount of public goodwill, even from people who wouldn't normally support Boris Johnson. Um, And that began to ebb away when we got to around about Easter of last year with the Dominic Cummings example and the various scandals, what happened to Professor Ferguson and so on and so forth. And in recent weeks, there have been further hiccups of those around Boris Johnson, if you like, particularly in relation to Matt Hancock. But in electoral terms, it's also hard to assess the situation. We saw what happened in Hartlepool, where the Conservatives won the by-election there. We saw how their vote held up in local council elections. Uh, They had a chance of winning Batley and Spen, but that went to Labour, unexpectedly so. But also we saw in the um, the Cheshire and Amersham by-election, Cheryl Gillan's old seat, uh, how they lost that. So it does seem to me, Greg, as though in the south of England, the Conservative Party is in quite a bit of trouble, very often to do with planning regulations in relation, in, in the case of uh, this particular seat, it was HS2 was a big factor. But there's also plans to pave over significant chunks of southern England, which is not going down well with local people. But in the north, the Red Wall, if you like, and in the Midlands, Conservative popularity and Boris Johnson's personal popularity does seem to be holding up. Where do you think we're at in terms of his popularity right now? Well, let's be a little bit more accurate than the slightly knee-jerk comment of, and in Batley and Spen, Labour held the seat. Labour were thrashed in Batley and Spen. Their majority dropped like a brick and they scraped in. So actually, the Tories did damn well. But not as well as they were predicted to do. I mean, the the booking um, odds. I I went on Betfair when the polls closed. The Tories were odds on to win the seat. And I saw we got to three, four in the morning. There were rumours coming around that Labour were doing considerably better than expected. Then the odds started to shift very, very quickly. This was a seat the Conservatives thought they were going to win. And not only did they think it, so did the the bookies. Hmm. Um, So I think it was a fluke that Labour got back in with the narrowest of majorities. Mm. So I don't think that was a bad result for the Tories. It just wasn't as good as they would have liked. A huge amount of dishonesty in Batley and Spen and very vicious and unpleasant commentary coming out of Labour, Mm. who... Had there been time to analyse and the reporters and media had been honest about it, I think Labour would have been thrashed. Well, things went on at Batley and Spen. George Galloway is going to take legal action over certain aspects of it. So I'm going to be a bit careful about not commenting on that because I'm not even sure whether legal proceedings are active. But address the wider point, if you would, please, Greg, in terms of I just addressed then the Conservatives do appear to be in significant trouble in southern England, mainly to do with issues, local issues to do with planning. And yet they're holding up rather well overall in the North and in the Midlands. It's an extraordinary flip as where you would traditionally expect to see the Conservatives doing well. What does this say about Boris Johnson, do you think? That he's doing magnificently. Uh, Magnificently, that's a very strong way of putting it, magnificently, bearing in mind we're in a pandemic. And there is a reason for that. There is absolutely no possible sign of an opposition or anyone who could conduct themselves seriously as head of a government in Parliament at the moment, then one might emerge. But he's doing magnificently for the simple reason that Labour are making it incredibly easy by having absolutely nobody of any significance whatsoever. Yes, this is an open goal. Yes. but The other day, um, they won something that An awful lot of people were predicting they were going to lose with 32 majority. Okay, that's not good when they have 80 majority in the House. But what percentage 
didn't vote because they knew they were going to win anyway. But is there a wider problem here, though? Because it's never a good thing in a democracy when you don't have a credible opposition that looks like a government in waiting and keeping the government of the day on its toes. Democracy only works well when you've got a government and an opposition that looks like a potential government in waiting. There are two problems now. Point one, yes, I do agree with you insofar as the Labour Party no longer looks credible in terms of, OK, I wasn't born until 1983, but very, very easily I can name eight or nine members of Harold Wilson and Jim Callaghan's cabinet, all of whom were potential prime ministers in waiting. I struggle to name the shadow chancellor, the shadow home secretary, the shadow foreign secretary. You go out onto the street, very, very few people could name any of those people. They are not household names. And yet here we are, um, well over 40 years after Harold Wilson and Jim Callaghan left office, and yet the names like... Dennis Healy, Tony Benn, Barbara Castle, these still roll off people's tongues even now, those who are over 50 particularly. But I think there's also a problem here on the Conservative side as well, in that the calibre of backbench MP on both sides of the House is rather poor. Boris Johnson, to quite a large extent, has been sort of held to ransom by this group of MPs who are pushing for an opening up and a relaxation of COVID restrictions, even if the evidence suggested that was unwise. Boris Johnson has taken a gamble here with the speed in which he's opening up, which is to a far greater extent than most other countries that are in a similar position. And I know your MP, Mark Harper, is very much a part of this group. Um, and uh, you know people like Sir Desmond Swain. But you've got a lot of people who are putting crass levels of pressure on Boris Johnson to open up. And also, I think when it comes to talent, even on the Conservative front bench, the government front bench, how many of those are really household names? And how many people on the Conservative back benches with this majority of 80 look like potential ministers in waiting? I have to be honest, Greg, I don't think many of them do. I think you've made a little bit of a classic mistake. You have said that politicians on both sides are not good, verging on rubbish, mm. which I totally agree with. And one of the biggest causes of that is the media is an absolute bloody disgrace and the civil servants are about as much use as a soup sandwich. The entire system of governance is dependent at the moment on the competence of one man, which is terrifying. It is, but do you think, okay, we'll expand this in a moment. A very, very simple, I want a short answer on this, please. Do you think that Boris Johnson will lead the Conservative Party into the next election? That will be his choice, not the party's. Right. OK. All right. Now, I always look when it comes to politicians as to what, what kind of a person they are. I ask three questions, really. What are your political principles? What kind of moral compass do you have? And do you have the skill set necessary to lead a government effectively? And I've had concerns about Boris Johnson in this regard, in, in all three of those regards, really, for some years. You look back in terms of his principles and his ethics, look back to his early career. Within a year of becoming a trainee reporter at the Times, he was sacked for making up a quote from his godfather, the historian Colin Lucas. In 1995, when Boris Johnson was assistant editor of the Daily Telegraph, a recording of a telephone conversation from four years earlier emerged where he plotted with his old, old Etonian friend Darius Guppy to have the then News of the World reporter Stuart Collier beaten up. Uh, Darius Guppy was later jailed for an attempted jewel fraud. And by 2004, Boris Johnson had spent more than a decade in senior editorial roles and three years as a Conservative MP. But as editor of The Spectator, he saw fit to publish a stupid and highly offensive article about the people of Liverpool. We know who wrote that. It wasn't him, but Boris Johnson signed it off. They making insulting references to the Hillsborough disaster and the death of Kenneth Bigley in Iraq. And I was living in Liverpool at that time. I remember the controversy very well. That same year, he was sacked from the Conservative front bench by the then leader, Michael Howard, over an extramarital affair. Um, and what I'm saying, Greg, is well, that... would be empty if you did that now. Yeah, but what I'm saying is, Greg, that he's always had a bit of a strange relationship with the truth and a strange relationship with honesty. We can't say this guy is somehow whiter than white and purer than pure. This is not a good track record, either in terms of journalistic ethics. And by the way, I haven't touched on those old Daily Telegraph columns he used to write where he used to make up 
some fairly loopy things about the EU when the truth was bad enough. He didn't have to make things up. The truth was bad enough. The sort of things Christopher Booker was telling us in the Sunday Telegraph about the EU was bad enough. The things Boris Johnson was making up didn't help the cause, in my view. This is not a man known for his truthfulness and his honesty. I totally agree with you. Mm. Now look around the rest of Parliament. Yeah, but Keir that's... A, that, that's Keir Star, hang on, Keir Starmer? Yeah. As his, his primary con competitor, a man who, when he was at the CPS, went out of his way to cover up Muslim rape gangs and not bring them to court... Yeah, I'm not defending Sir Keir Starmer, but this is a very depressing indictment of the quality of person we have but in public life. To have, when it comes to Keir Starmer having a knighthood, would that his father have worn one? Well, how many people have been awarded stuff in the honours that, frankly, is absurd? I mean, you, you look at Jimmy Savile had a knighthood, for example, and all sorts of people who have been disgraced have been honoured in, in you know this honours system we have every New Year and every Queen's birthday. It's Christi an absurd system. Christina Dick has just been further venerated. What a disgrace she is. Right, but this is, this is the wider problem, though, isn't it? The calibre yes. of person we have in public life is not good. Now, And in the press. Well, 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 and in civil service. Yeah, but, but let, let's... Most bank managers are about 12 years old. Yeah, but let's, let's look at something a bit more recent. As mayor of London, uh, Boris Johnson was given advance notice of the arrest of Conservative MP Damien Green. He put pressure on the acting uh, Metropolitan Police Commissioner Paul Stevenson not to proceed with the arrest. Johnson was at the time chair of the Metropolitan Police Authority, part of his role as mayor of London, meaning he isn't permitted to be involved in operational matters. Uh, Johnson was found not guilty on all charges following an in-house inquiry, but it's hard to reach any conclusion other than he was informed of Green's arrest in his capacity as chair of the Metropolitan Police Authority, but he had reacted in his role as a conservative politician. So his ethics there, again, when he held senior office as mayor of London, much more recently than the stuff I just mentioned are brought into question. Uh, quite honestly, if you work in a septic tank, you do get covered in audio. Mm. And I'm I'm sorry, it's not a matter of how good or how bad he is. It's all a matter of relativity. Name someone, anyone on the Labour benches who you would rather have had in office for Brexit, the tidying up of Brexit and negotiations, and for the astonishingly difficult task of dealing with a pandemic no one had any experience of, or any understanding of. The choice I was faced with in December 2019 at the general election was do I want Boris Johnson or Jeremy Corbyn to be Prime Minister? And for that, that was a very easy decision for me. The answer was Boris Johnson, even though I had enormous misgivings about his leadership qualities, his moral compass and his political principles. Uh, when it comes to political principles, I think his predecessor as Mayor of London, Ken Livingstone, summed it up very well some years ago, where he says the, the only thing Boris Johnson really believes in is being there. However, Boris Johnson was elected, got a majority of 80 and a healthy majority, and on Brexit he has delivered. And I think that is largely how and why his vote is holding up, particularly in the North. However, something interesting has happened. I think Boris Johnson changed quite significantly after coming out of hospital after being seriously ill with COVID last year. I think the old devil may care attitude has gone. He's become very big on environmentalism, sucking up to the green lobby, following their agenda. Uh, he's an interventionist conservative, and I'll come on to the significance of that in a moment's time. But I think his new wife, Carrie, has a huge amount of sway and a huge amount of influence over him. He's very big on the environmentalism stuff and very big on the green cult these days, is he not? I think Carrie has far too much influence and far too little brain. Mm. I don't think she knows a damn thing about the countryside. I am morally certain she knows nothing about the progress of climate. She has little or no understanding of uh, so-called green energy and the damage it does to the planet. She has no idea of renewable energy and the fact that you have to keep renewing wind turbines and solar panels on a regular basis, doing yet more damage to the planet. She has no idea when it comes to electric cars, which require 183 kilos of copper in each one, which 
in Britain with 36 million cars amounts to 6,588,000,000 million kilos of copper, which is actually rather more than is existing on the planet. Right. So we've established then that carry has a significant amount of influence and that influence is dangerous. Um, and and this, this is going to very likely knock him significantly off course from where he should be. Is it not the case, though, Greg, that I've highlighted Boris Johnson's faults in quite a lot of detail already? I am aware he has got good qualities. He's shown personal kindness to people I have known. And he is very loyal to his staff and those who've worked under him in editorial roles, um, you know, towards journalists who've been he's had control over, if you like, and been in charge of. He has been decent with them. But is it not the case, Greg, that Boris Johnson is essentially a good time leader? We saw him at his best round about the London 2012 Olympics, the way he steered the country through that when it was party time and there was a lot to be happy about. But the period ahead now, Greg, is going to be difficult because there's going to be tax rises, there's going to be public spending cuts to pay for the ongoing pandemic. And I don't believe we're out of this by a very long way. He's not a leader for difficult times, is he? An extraordinary thing to say. Why? He hasn't had one second of good time. No, not yet. Time but since he's been leader. Well, not yet he hasn't. No, he well, has had but bad times, and he has led us in almost every way superbly through that. Dim well, those difficulties and. Well, well, you, you go and say that to people who have lost loved ones in care homes because he sent people out of hospitals into care sorry, when sorry, they were suffering from COVID. That's what happened. I Sorry, I must interrupt. He has made mistakes. He faced a pandemic that absolutely nobody on the planet understood. He faced a pandemic where no one had the vaguest clue what to do. He faced a pandemic that no one had in living memory had any experience of, and he made some mistakes. He made several. That does not mean that he didn't do his best and he didn't do better than anyone else you could mention in Parliament who was significantly in opposition to his views and who could have led the party. He has had nothing, nothing but adverse conditions to deal with. And you say his only skill is a good time leader. Well, I think we saw him at his best in good, good times. Time. Well, yeah, he, he did have good times as mayor of London. When, no, when no, no, was... no, he said good time leader. We're talking about him as leader hmm. of the government. Yes, but look, it, I don't think you need any great expertise or any great medical knowledge to suss out that if you've got a, if you're at the start of a pandemic and the priority is to protect the most vulnerable, filling a care home for, full of people who are just coming out of the hospital infected with that very virus is not a good move. I don't think you need to be any great expert to, um, to acknowledge that's not a good idea. But It is a, if you think that those people are in a hospital and they are likely to infect perfectly healthy young people on a wholesale basis, um, in a transiently based hospital. Well, young, to... young people Oops. are far more likely to recover from COVID than elderly people. Nobody knew that. That is just to be wise after the event. Well, no one had the vaguest clue. Spanish flu, for instance, killed mostly young people, not the elderly. In the time we got left now, I want to talk about the Red Wall. And we've only got a couple of minutes on this, I'm afraid. But... The sort of people that lived there and voted gave Boris Johnson his 80 seat majority in December 2019. They're not what you would call small state conservatives in the traditional the Thatcherite mold, if you like. And I don't think Boris Johnson is a Thatcherite. What the people in the Red Wall, first of all, they voted conservative because they wanted Brexit done, which has been delivered. But when the next election comes around in another less than four years, it will be now, if possibly considerably shorter than that. Uh, if they choose to go for an earlier election. But what they want in terms of, they're going to be looking over the course of this government, has my life improved? And they're looking at big spending capital projects. They're often in receipt of welfare payments and will want that to continue. But they're also socially conservative. They're big on British identity. They're not big on the woke agenda. They, they have fairly socially conservative attitudes and values in these red wall seats. And they're also very pro-British. I think, Greg, that come the next election, they will want to see 
as a reward for them giving the Conservatives their vote, they'll want tangible evidence that their lives have improved. And I think that is going to, and Boris Johnson, he's indicated in, in very recent speeches that this does mean big spending capital projects. What direction do you think he's going to go in and what direction should he go in to ensure that they vote in Conservative, get to see tangible benefits in the lifetime of a parliament? The one direction that he's got to go in is get the British people back to work profitably. Whether that is in the northern seats, it would be very good to see. Whether he can achieve it is important, but they won't be voting based on that. They will be base voting based on, oh my God, look at the awful alternative. That I think is a valid point, and that I'm afraid is where we're gonna to have to leave things. My thanks as always to Greg, my thanks to you for listening. Join us again next time.